to just really quickly go over the agenda for today. We're going to start off with a little bit of housekeeping. So um, all the participants are currently in listen-only mode. If you have a question, please type it into the question and answer box in the GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, we found this to be extremely helpful not only to be able to follow up with questions um, if we have more questions than we have time to answer, and also to cut down on background noise. So uh, that being said, um, today we're going to go ahead and talk about um, what is responsibility provision. We'll talk in kind of bigger picture on how it works. We'll talk about who can participate. We'll look at an example calculation. We'll talk about the timeline for participation. There are some resources that are available, and we'll share those with you. We'll also talk a little bit about the benefits, and then we will have um, some time for some questions. So first, we're going to go ahead and start off with a poll question. So we're curious, um, how many of you have heard about the community eligibility provision? We'll go ahead and get about 15 seconds for a response. All right, so we're going to go ahead and close it. And it looks like the majority of you have not heard about the community eligibility provision. Um, so this is exciting. We're um, excited that you all joined us on the webinar and are here to learn a little more about this provision. Okay. So what is the community eligibility provision? It was previously known as the community eligibility option. And that may be a term you've heard of previously. They changed it to community eligibility provision to be more consistent with other provisions, um, such as provision two, which some of you may be familiar with. And uh, it provides an alternative to household applications for meal benefits. And this is something we're really excited about, and I think that districts will be really excited about. I've yet to encounter anyone that's really excited about um, applications and that whole process. Um, schools in 11 states have piloted the program. They have almost 4,000 schools participating. So um, USDA opened it up to some states to um, see who wanted to pilot the program. And that, that's been underway. Uh, and starting July 1 of 2014, It's going to be available nationwide. So here's a quick graphic showing which states piloted it at which time point. So uh, Illinois, Michigan, and Kentucky were some of the first. Uh, they piloted it out in the 11-12 school year. They added a few more in 12-13. Um, a couple of states added this current school year. Um, and, and as I said, starting with the 14-15 school year, it will be available nationwide. So how does it work? Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about some basics, and then we'll get into a little more detail. Um, so schools that are participating must serve breakfast and lunch for free to all students for a cycle of four years. They must count total lunches and total breakfast served to students daily. And schools that are participating cannot collect household applications for free or reduced price meals. So we'll talk about the data you use to determine your claiming percentages. But um, really one of the most important things to know um, is that schools that are participating are, are very strictly forbidden from taking applications, um, which can be a real benefit for school food service. So to talk a little more about how it works, the school district are participating schools, and we'll talk about kind of who can participate on the next slide. 
must have an identified student percentage of at least 40% as of April 1st of the school year prior to implementing the community eligibility provision. Um, and one school can participate, a group of schools can participate, or an entire district can participate. So um, let's, let's get a little deeper into what that identified student percentage is referring to. So the identified student percentage is determined by um, getting the number of children who are certified for a free school meal without application. So this is going to be all your direct cert matches. And um, this is um, the, the broad sense of direct cert matches. So this includes your SNAP, your TANF. It also includes your FTPIR and students that are on your uh, migrant or homeless list. So everybody that's direct cert through those means. And then you're going to divide that number by the total number of enrolled students. And they're defining total enrolled students as students who are enrolled in attending schools participating in the community eligibility provision who have access to at least one meal service daily. So um, students that you would not include in this calculation are students like half day kindergarten that didn't have access to a meal program. So to kind of put these together um, in a visual sense, the identified student percentage is the number of, of identified students, so all DC matches, divided by the total number of enrolled students with access to school lunch or school breakfast. And you can, you can do this calculation with students just looking at one individual school. You can look at um, grouping schools together. Or um, if you meet certain criteria, the entire district and all schools in that district could participate. So there are a lot of possibilities on, on, on this provision. One of the requirements, 40% for the individual school, the group of schools, or the entire school district uh, must be at least 40% identified student percentage to participate. And in terms of grouping schools, um, you would divide the total number of identified students for all group schools by the total enrollment for all group schools to determine eligibility. So um, in thinking about grouping schools, uh, not all schools in the group or the school district have to meet the 40% threshold. It's just a group of them. Some of them all together have to meet 40%. And schools don't have to be adjacent to each other or be in close proximity. So if you have a cluster of schools that have a high DC match um, and you incorporate another school that doesn't have as high of a DC match rate and you group those together and they meet the 40% when looking at all students totaled together, you could group those schools and utilize the community eligibility provision for that group of schools. So what about the claiming percentage? Uh, your identified student percentage multiplied by a factor of 1.6 equals the total, or I'm sorry, um, that equals the, the number of meals served at the, or that are reimbursed at the federal free rate. The remainder of that percentage, and we'll go over a sample calculation so this hopefully will be more clear, are reimbursed at the paid rate. And any meal costs in excess of the total federal reimbursement must be covered through non-federal sources. So you do need to do some calculations to determine what your federal reimbursement will look like and how you could cover, cover that if it, if it was not going to cover all of your costs. And you can't claim more meals than were served. So if uh, you reach 62.5% of your identified student percentage, then essentially 100% of your meal is claimed at the free rate. So where did that 1.6 come from? 
Analysis show that on average, for every 10 direct certification match students, there were six more students certified based on an income application. So if you multiply the identified student percentage by 1.6, you're approximating the free and reduced percentage. And the average means that some schools will be on the higher end and some on the lower end serves as a proxy across many low-income schools. So they're, they're looking at extrapolating that data to um, equate what they've seen from a historical perspective. So to look at an example, um, if the identified student percentage was 50%, so 50% of students at that um, group of schools or that one school, 50% um, were DC matches. The free claiming percentage would be 80%, so that's 50% times 1.6. The pay claiming percentage would be 20%, um, that being the difference. So if every day you served 1,000 meals, the number of free meals would be 800. The number of paid meals would be 200. And USDA has developed a reimbursement estimator tool that can help with projections. And we'll show you that tool on a later slide. And it will also be coming out as a numbered memo so that you can um, put in some of your schools and, and, and look at some calculations and see where things might shake out. So who can participate? Um, as we said before, starting July 1, so the 14-15 school year, all districts nationwide can participate. And any school district, large or small, can participate. And there are definitely some advantages to a large district utilizing this option. Um, and in thinking about the reduced administrative burden of not collecting and processing applications at that site, but also there's the potential for small schools to really benefit from this program. So in thinking about small schools that maybe are, are near a reservation and have a really high FDPIR match rate, those schools could really benefit. Um, even schools as small as 10 or 15 students, if the majority of those are, are DC matched, then that could really be beneficial and, and would reduce um, the burden of collecting applications at that school. Um, and then in a large school, um, that, could, that could work out equally as well. So um, how do you update the claiming percentages? So you aren't necessarily locked into this one rate for the one rate for the rest of the four-year cycle. Um, a new identified student percentage can be established each year. So during the second, third, and fourth years, the SFA or school can select the higher of the identified student percentage from the year directly prior or the year prior to the first year of operating the community eligibility provision. So it's just really important for districts to um, be looking at that um, percentage of DC match and um, knowing where that data stands and if they're going to need to make a change. What about establishing a new cycle? So to begin a new four-year cycle, uh, SFAs or schools must establish a new identified student percentage as of April 1 of the fourth year of the previous cycle. So this is really looking pretty far down the road, but um, in thinking about how you start a new cycle, um, you begin a new four-year cycle if all eligibility criteria is met with state agency permission. And uh, SFAs or schools in year four with an identified student percentage of less than 40% but greater than 30 can elect for an additional year. Um, they've been referring to it as a grace year. So there's a little bit of flexibility if you aren't quite at that exact 40%. To talk a little bit about the timeline for participation. So each year, we'll be required to assemble um, a list of our, our SFAs in the following categories. School districts that would be eligible district-wide, so school districts with an identified student percentage of at least 40%. Uh, 
nearly eligible school districts, so ones with an identified student percentage greater than 30 but less than 40, a list of those currently operating the community eligibility provision district-wide, and then those currently in the fourth year of community eligibility provision and eligible for a grade year. So those that are in a fourth year um, with a, a less than 40 percent but a greater than 30. And we'll be collecting this data from you and, and publishing it on um, the USDA Community Eligibility Provision website. Um, and we'll be sending out guidance on how to report the data soon. We have a, a webinar next week with USDA where we're hoping to gather some really concrete details on how we're to collect the data from you and how that data is going to be reported out. Um, so there will be a really formal mechanism for this. Um, but if you're interested in this and you have some schools that you think may be a good fit, it, it would be wise to start looking at your identified student percentage at the schools now so that you can see who may be getting close and maybe looking at some possible groupings of schools. School districts or SFAs intending to elect this provision, if some are all schools, are going to be required to submit to the state agencies, so that's us, documentation by June 30th of the year prior to starting CEP. So if this is something that you wanted to pursue for the 14-15 school year, keep in mind that June 30th is going to be the drop dead date to let us know um, that you are going to be pursuing that. And also there's a requirement that um, you'll need to ensure documentation demonstrates the school or the school district meets the identified student percentage threshold as of April 1st of the prior school year. And again, we're awaiting some more concrete details from USDA, and we'll be sharing those with you when we get them. So now to go over to a quick poll question. And this is by no means binding in any way, shape, or form, but just out of curiosity, um, how many of you plan to implement the community eligibility provision? Or I guess I could rephrase this to say, how many of you are interested in pursuing this? Give folks a few more minutes to answer. Sorry, I'm sorry, seconds. <laughs> um, all right, we'll go ahead and close the poll. But it looks like. Um, the vast majority of you, about three quarters, are interested in pursuing this option. We'll share those results, um, which is really exciting. I think there are a lot of um, advantages to, to pursuing this provision. All right, so what are the benefits? Um, I think that the, the the largest, most obvious benefit is with no household applications, there's a, a great reduction in burden, um, not only in, in processing those applications, but also um, eliminating the burden of verification at those schools. Um, there's also a reduced chance of over-identification because everyone eats for free. And compared to other special provisions, there's no base year. So you don't have that, that base year where you're still collecting applications. Um, it seems like it's a little more streamlined process, and that's the feedback um, that, that states and districts that already implemented this have also given. Um, there's also some, some data um, from, I believe this is out of Kentucky, um, that between October 2010 and October 2012, schools that operated the community eligibility provision for two years saw a pretty significant increase in meal participation. So at lunch, they saw a saw 13% increase in participation. And at breakfast, they saw a 25% increase, which is really exciting and, of course, something that um, we're always um, happy to see and, and, and pushing for. So to talk about some resources, and um, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that 
this community eligibility provision is still relatively new, and um, more and more guidance will be coming out on it. But um, right now, uh, USDA has a reimbursement estimator tool. And after this slide, I'll show a, a screenshot of what that tool looks like, and we'll go through what kind of information it can give you. Um, and as I said, it'll be sent out as a numbered memo. Um, USDA um, is creating a community eligibility provision website um, that we are awaiting its release. Um, we've also been told that soon we'll have official guidance on this topic, which we're greatly looking forward to. Food Research and Action Council, um, usually referred to as FRAC, they have a great um, web page set up with a lot of resources, um, examples from states, and also um, copies of uh, PowerPoint slides that you can use if you wanted to um, talk about this to your school board, your superintendent. Um, the School Nutrition Association also has um, posted on the website as a PDF, but it has some information and also some, some further resources. And we will um, send out these slides after the webinar so that you can um, have the URL and, and click on those and check some of that stuff out. So to talk about this um, community eligibility provision tool, um, it's a, an Excel spreadsheet, um, whether you love it or hate it, <laughs> so what we have. Um, and just kind of starting from the top, it'll ask you your total number of identified students. So those are, um, those are all your DC match kids. And again, that's SNAP, TNF, FDPIR, homeless and migrant. Um, it'll ask you to plug in your total student enrollment. And you can do this looking at one school. You can do it looking at a group of schools. You can do it looking at your whole entire district. Um, so it will go ahead and tell you your identified student percentage. And it's going to give you a red box if you don't meet that 40%, and a green if you do meet the 40%. Um, it will tell you the percentage of meals reimbursed at the free and the paid rate. And you, you also have to plug in your um, reimbursement rates, but those are on a separate tab, and it's, it's pretty easy to just pull it over. Um, and also ask you about your additional six cents. Um, you'll enter in your number of lunches served and number of breakfasts. And then step four is optional. So you can kind of play around with your participation changes. So looking at some data um, showing that the community eligibility provision increases participation, you can plug some increases in there to see how that would affect your bottom line or your, your, um, your amount of reimbursement. And then over here in this green section, it will go ahead and tell you what um, your federal reimbursements will look like monthly. So this is looking at data for a month, um, but it will help you look at some numbers and, and compare what your reimbursement um, could be utilizing this provision as opposed to what it, what it currently is. And then it'll also tell you the monthly amount of non-federal funds needed. Um, so that, that's valuable information to, to gather and, and to look at and know how you would potentially cover that gap. And in order to get data from that red section, you have to know what it costs you to produce a meal. So you plug your cost of producing a meal in this bottom step five um, in order to get the data in this red section. So there are some challenges um, to this, this particular provision. And the challenges mainly center around the lack of student level free or reduced data. So that presents challenges for Title I, for E-rates, for other uh, state or local grant programs. And um, USDA has uh, been working and talking with the United States Department of Education. And um, the Department of Education has um, said that they're going to be issuing guidance on this topic. Um, USDA presented at the Title I State Directors Conference um, to provide information and talk about options. And here at the Nevada Department of Agriculture, 
We've also worked with Nevada Department of Ed folks to provide information on community eligibility provision and talk about the challenges of the lack of student level data. Um, so they are aware of, of the possibility of schools pursuing this option and um, the, the challenges that that could present. And if you have any questions about um, any of these issues, um, please contact your nutrition program professional and we can hook you up with resources or um, work with you to facilitate conversations with those Department of Ed folks or your school district folks to work through that challenge. All right, so those are the basics. And um, we now have plenty of time for questions. And again, um, you're all in listen-only mode, so if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions box um, that's in your GoToWebinar toolbar. Okay, so we have a question from Crystal out in Mineral, and she says, total number enrollment, does this include preschool and kindergarten? Which is kind of a tricky question. So preschool and kindergarten would be included if they participate in your meal program. So the kids that would not be included are um, half-day kindergarten that don't have access to the meal program, um, maybe they participate in special milk instead. So if your pre-K and your kindergarten students do have access to the school breakfast and lunch program, then you would include them in your enrollment. 